All right, well, I'll go ahead and give an introduction because we're just coming up on noon now. Um, welcome everyone to the return of photos at Zoom. This is a program we started in March of this year after the museum initially closed to stop the spread of COVID-19. And we ran this program every week until the end of June when the museum reopened. Um, and it's an opportunity for us to engage with you virtually with the museum's permanent collection while the museum is closed based on certain themes that we build around works in our permanent collection of over 16,000 photographs. So we're bringing it back now that the museum's closed again and we'll hopefully do this regularly until we can reopen. Um, the topic for today is about politics and protest. And this is based on our current exhibition, What Does Democracy Look Like? And many of the images I'm going to talk about today are included in the exhibition. I know you can't go see it on the walls, but this hopefully also functions as a little bit of an exhibition tour of sorts. Um, so just to give you a sense of the museum in case you've never been there before, typically we do these types of discussions in our print study room. This is our tiny print study room and one of our former graduate students, Jordan Putt, leading a discussion on um, works of portraiture in the collection with a class. Um, we do this multiple times per day in normal times when it's not a pandemic and we can gather. And these are usually more discussion-based conversations. So they're exercises in close looking with students, um, really thinking about the materiality of the print, the choices the artists have made, and even the size of the prints or the types of paper, um, comparing images to one another and thinking about the relationships of images and, and the works that artists are doing in comparison to other artists working at that time. Um, they're really a fun part of the job to engage with students in this way. So although you can't participate in discussion on this format, I encourage you all to post any questions or comments in the chat or the Q&A field. And I'll be checking those um, towards the end of the presentation and answering as many questions as I can then. Oops. So um, if you ever want to resource, uh, go back to this recording on our um, main website, I wanted to point you to this digital programs option button here where you can click on any past photos at Zoom sessions and view the recordings and also any extended resources we post, as well as this recording if you ever want to refer back to it or can't stay for the whole viewing. Um, and when you click on that, you will see this page, which shows all of the prior sessions we have led so far. And we'll keep building this as we uh, create more in the future. So let's get started. Um, if you were to walk into the museum right now, this is exactly what it would look like because it's completely empty. Um, we do have some staff members still coming in and working in their offices, but um, this is the exhibition that's still on the walls. It's called, What Does Democracy Look Like? And for this exhibition, we invited seven different professors at Columbia College Chicago, which is our parent institution, to mine the museum's permanent collection to answer that question, what does democracy look like? Leading up to the recent 2020 presidential election. So of course, thinking about American democracy, but also um, global issues of democracy and just thinking creatively with what they could use our collection to kind of tell these stories. So essentially it's seven mini exhibitions and one larger one. What you see here is half of the wall and the, the tree image and on the left is a section that's curated by Honor Osterk. And then on the right is a selection curated by an art history professor, Melody Chambliss. So the museum's kind of divided up with all these different mini exhibitions. Um, this is another install shot of Ames Hawkins installation where Ames went through the collection purely picking images based on the saturation of color and created sort of a demographic showing um, voting patterns from 1980 until 2020. Actually, this has been updated since the installation shot. So on the right side here, it now includes the statistics of voting voter turnout in 2020. So in the bottom here, it lists the candidates and then the percentage of the Republican vote or the Democratic vote. So the red here represents the kind of amount of Republican votes. So there's more showing if more turnout for Republican voters came out in that year. And then the blue representing Democratic votes. So it sort of cascades and shows sort of voter trends, but then also leaves this huge white space in the middle showing a void of people who choose not to vote or cannot vote. Um, so pointing to the big gap and how this, this democracy we live in in America doesn't actually represent all people living in America. Um, and also within the museum during this exhibition, 
we had a voter registration table, which was really exciting. So a lot of curators focused on voting and the importance of voting and you were able to register to vote right in the museum space. So I thought that was such a great creative initiative um, set up by Sharon Bloyd, Sharon Bloyd Peshkin, who is one of the guest curators as well. Um, but with that, I will get started in talking about some collection pieces. Um, I'm thinking about protest a lot in this discussion today, but also sort of um, capturing key kind of moments in our political landscape that shift um, history and how the camera can kind of capture that and tell stories um, that then live on past that history for us to understand it as we move away from that moment. Um, so I wanted to start, I'd like to start with some history and I wanted to start with this image by Lewis Hine that was photographed on Ellis Island of Italian immigrants in 1905. Um, so between 1892 and 1924, approximately 12 million people immigrated to the United States at the port of New York and New Jersey. Um, so Lewis Hine was there photographing. He was kind of posthumously recognized for his photography, but he was doing this work um, with the motivation of creating kind of empathy for um, stories that he thought people didn't understand through the news. Like when you have 12 million people, how do you understand one person's story. So connecting um, on a more empathetic level, we have a mother and a child, but what's so striking to me about this image is the, the fence behind her, um, particularly now as we think about immigration and we hear a lot of stories about cages and walls. Um, I don't think that's what's happening in this image, but it takes on new meaning for me as I look at this kind of fence behind her and the people kind of held behind that wall. I feel like this image is both very beautiful and poetic and also incredibly heavy as we think about it now in 2020, especially. Um, so I sort of wanted to start with that. I feel like a lot of the works in the exhibition hit moments that are optimistic and sweet and beautiful, and then also really heavy, dark moments of kind of the history of democracy. We'll kind of talk about some of both of that. Um, so this is another kind of more sweet view without the heaviness. Um, this is an image of course, at Ellis Island also of the Statue of Liberty taken by Art Shea. Art Shea is one of Chicago's most famous photographers um, who recently passed away. And this project is from a series he created called My Florence that was more personal about his wife and his family and sort of all the way up through her death. Um, so the works document a lot of their like family vacations and sort of their just sort of everyday moments together. But I liked this image too, that, that one of the curators chose it in the exhibition, I think talking about some of the ideals of democracy or what we think of when we think of democracy in America, you have these kind of icons and symbols. And I think the Statue of Liberty is one of them. And of course, this is the place that was welcoming all the immigrants and the, the Statue of Liberty itself has a, a poem um, on the plaque that says, I wrote it down here, give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe freely. Um, so it's the symbol of kind of everything that we strive for or think of when we think about preserving our democracy and our America, I think is, is keeping that kind of melting pot idea that we formed um, many years ago. So I liked this image included in the exhibition, even though of course it's not of protest, but I think it, is, it speaks a lot to what we think of when we think of democracy. Um, but this image is another by Art Shea that, that gets into more of what we'll be talking about today. This image is not included in the exhibition and I'm surprised that nobody chose it. Um, this is one of my favorites in the collection because it was created down the street from the museum, almost next door. Um, the 1968 Democratic National Convention protests, of course, were very, very important in the history, um, in American history. Um, many people probably learned more about it recently with the film, The Chicago Seven, or The Trials of the Chicago Seven that just came out, the Aaron Sorkin film, and it was filmed at Grant Park across the street from the museum. Um, this Hilton Hotel is still standing there. We see kind of the sign here. Many of the museum staff members go to the gym in this hotel. Um, it's really our neighbor, but it was such an important place for a very important protest where a lot of anti-Vietnam War demonstrators gathered. Um, the story is essentially they were trying to get a permit to do peaceful protest and Richard Daly would not grant the permit because he was trying to project a certain view of Chicago to the world during this time of being one that's very under control and without any kind of riffraff. And so um, they still demonstrated and then there was um, conflict with the police which led to rioting. So this image is really, really heavy because you see 
the raised rifles of the police officers, but you just get the silhouette and kind of more the mood of the kind of tension that's felt there. And then you have this welcome Democrats sign that I think um, tells you so much in this image. You have Hilton, welcome Democrats, pedestrians sort of walking around and then these armed um, military policemen. So you know that there is something about to go down in this image. It's the only one we have in our collection from the DNC protests, but I'm so happy that we have it. This is a photograph that I took <laughs> that I saw them filming the Chicago 7 film um, at Grant Park one day when I was uh, out having lunch with Dawu Bay and Natasha Egan, our director. So this is a photograph I took of Dawu Bay photographing the set because we noticed these old timey police cars and people dressed as hippies standing in the park and went over and, and took the look. So it was pretty exciting to see a set of them filming that. And this is sort of a scene from the film of what that moment kind of looked like. But this again is very special to me because it's right by the actual museum itself. And sometimes when you're just walking around Chicago, you can feel the history. And I, I love that about living in the city. So I'm gonna transition to some more work in the, in the exhibition. Um, this is an, an image taken by Danny Lyon, who we've talked about in previous photos at Zoom sessions. And I will continue to probably talk about him because I love these in our collection. They're so special. Um, Danny Lyon was the first staff photographer for SNCC, which is how you say the acronym for the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, which is a civil rights organization that was entirely student led and just completely shaped the civil rights movement. They did a lot of demonstrations for Black voter registration in the Deep South. And so a lot of the images that we have are about these um, efforts to open up voting in the South and to kind of break Jim Crow. Um, this image looks not so much like a protest to me. Like when you first look at it, it seems just sort of like a street scene, people walking down a street in the rain, a family, until you notice this sign, which of course does stand out, but it doesn't really look like a large demonstration. Um, you can see the sign probably says freedom. We don't know what else it says. Um, but one thing that I love about Danny Lyons photographs is he gave us really good captions. So we learn more about his images because he gives us names of these leaders who shaped the civil rights movement. So here he says, Fannie Lou Hamer, Shea Copper from a family of 20 children, evicted from her home for applying to register to vote, severely beaten in the Winona police station, SNCC field secretary from Ruleville and future Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party candidate for Congress, marches in the cold Hattiesburg rain. So we get a lot more information after we read that caption and learning about what was happening in this image and the reason for being in the rain in a protest um, fighting for the right to vote. Um, I love that this is chosen in the, um, the exhibition. It's part of Melanie Chambliss's installation that is a lot about the history of voting and sort of opening up access, marking the 100 year anniversary of women receiving the right to vote in 2020 and the 150th anniversary of black men receiving the right to vote. She talks a lot about that in her installation. Um, but another great, I wanted to talk about a few more Danny Lyons that are not in the show that I love. Um, this is one that, um, again, the title tells us so much. After giving a concert in a cotton field in Greenwood, Bob, D Bob Dylan plays behind the SNCC office. Bernice Regan, one of the original freedom singers and today leader of Sweet Honey in the Rock listens. Mindy Samstein sits behind Dylan and talks to Willie Blue. Um, 1963. So we learn who some of these people are and if he didn't label it we would have no idea that this figure sitting ne right next to Dylan is Bernice Reagan who is also just kind of a powerhouse in the civil rights movement. But also I love that we're seeing music in this image and music was a big part of the civil rights movement and especially with SNCC where um, freedom singers, the whole concept was in gathering and, and protesting with song and in singing during demonstrations, you're uniting people on this kind of um, shared feeling of, of, of humanity and kind of art and feeling the movement in such a different way through sound. Um, so music was a really big part of the civil rights movement and especially of SNCC initiatives. Um, so we have Bob Dylan here in the middle, who of course most people would recognize, um, but also he gives us in the captions that we know this is Bernice Reagan, who then also later um, founded the Mississippi Democratic, I'm gonna forget the actual name, um, but she worked a lot with Ella Baker to 
open up voting access in Mississippi. So there's just so much history and every person listed, I encourage all of you to look at SNCC's website if you're interested in learning more about the work they did. They have a timeline, they label all of the people who are key members and give you a lot more information about their efforts and what they've done, which is really inspiring, I think, as we um, think about activism in a different way in 2020. This image I like a lot as well, and it's not in the exhibition either, but um, going back to what I was talking about, of just not all of images about protest and about political movement having to be dark or heavy and dramatic. Um, this one has a lot of movement and energy and celebration to it, um, but it's sort of photographed in a similar way to the Art Shea, where you have these dark silhouettes that give a lot of just emotion. And I feel like in this photograph, you can feel like it you were in people celebrating as they were um, voting for the first time in Mississippi. So again, the title telling us a lot, Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party, that was the word I was, or the term I was looking for earlier about um, Bernice's um, organization that she started or helped start. So this image I just like a lot too, the kind of feeling of celebration and, and celebrating the progress from protesting and sort of your efforts being realized. And then one more Danny Lyon that I have to feature. This is my favorite one. Um, and it was supposed to be in the exhibition, but I think at the last minute it edited out, which was too bad. Um, but this is an image of John Lewis in Cairo, Illinois. So John Lewis, people probably know, but um, he became then Senator for many, many years and just passed away this year. Um, but a key member in the civil rights movement and in the organizing in the South. And here they're protesting in prayer. So kneeling and praying at a segregated pool in Cairo, Illinois. So in Illinois is not part of the Jim Crow South, but there was still segregation happening. It was kind of like Southern Illinois, right across the Ohio River and Jim Crow's kind of um, effects, I guess, were bleeding into the North. So this was the first effort that SNCC or the first demonstration that SNCC took in the North um, was in Cairo. So it was a very significant protest. It's also where Danny Lyon met John Lewis. Um, he met while hitchhiking to Cairo to go photograph. And they became good friends um, all the way up until John Lewis's death. So there's some great interviews and conversations with them online if you're ever interested in learning more about their relationship. Um, but something that's interesting I think about Danny Lyon that I didn't mention and him photographing SNCC is that SNCC had been doing all of this work and people largely didn't know about it. So once he started photographing, um, Julian Bond, one of the key members said that he gave movement to the movement. So he like helped recruit people into joining their efforts and sort of publicize all this work they were doing that otherwise was maybe not known about. Um, so this image in particular is really important because then it was used in promotional materials by SNCC. And I love this poster that is on the SNCC website that I found. Um, come let us build a new world together. And you can see that it's been cropped down a little bit. So in the last image, we have another figure here on the left and you sort of see that it's a larger group. And when you crop it, I feel like so much more attention goes on this center figure, this child. And I then read the image completely differently where I think about these two kind of adults protesting for her, and for her future is the way I read this. And it just becomes so much more quiet and poetic um, and just powerful. So I love that too, thinking about photography and how we edit images or see them used in other contexts, how it can then change our perception of them. Um, and then also this image, John Lewis tweeted in 2017 around the NFL protests um, where uh, the players were taking a knee um, in defense of black lives and uh, he quoted, he said, the young people kneeling today are following a long tradition and hashtagging good trouble. And that's something that he would say a lot is the importance of getting into good trouble. And there's a really good op-ed that he wrote just before his death this year, advising us all to do that and these young activists to continue getting into good trouble. So that image is so special in our collection. I love that we have it. Um, a few more civil rights images that I wanted to highlight. This is in the exhibition by Bruce Davidson. So a different photographer. Um, I feel like they look different than Danny Lyons, even though a lot of the similar moments and time period, of course, but he was photographing um, for Magnum and more, um, I think approaching it as um, an editorial project versus I think Danny Lyon was 
since he was hired by SNCC, he was hired more internally and photographing from that point of view of, of SNCC using the images instead of the images being seen by uh, for news stories or used in stories. So there's still very strong images, but I feel like there's just a difference in kind of the approach and the perspective and sort of maybe like a little bit more distance between the photographer and the subject. So this is a Selma March, one of the Selma marches in 1965. Um, a lot of information in this photograph, um, Equal Rights for All, Mississippi or Bust. Um, a lot of you probably know about these marches from the, the big film Selma that came out a few years ago. If you haven't seen it, I highly recommend it. Um, and here's another, again, that's in the show. You get a lot of information about what's happening in the protest, but it's not like Danny Lyons where you have the name of the person and more background of what organizations they're affiliated with or what they're doing or what they go on to do. Uh, we just know this protester is protesting against hotel discrimination in Atlanta. So asking for the hotels to desegregate. And then this image we have in the show too, um, and I love that this was chosen in the exhibition, um, particularly now as we think about Black Lives Matter protests happening right now and the kind of tension with police. Um, I thought this image is, was, was so interesting and in thinking about how this is a long struggle. It's not, you know, these, these conflicts with police is not something that's new to 2020 or the last four years, but it's something that is definitely a focal point right now. Um, I love this photograph because of her expression. It reminds me a lot in some ways of this photograph, which is not in our collection, but is um, kind of an iconic image already that was taken four years ago um, during a protest. And you see the police kind of swarming this woman and she's just in so much control of that moment and herself and her kind of calm, composed uh, sense of self. And I see that in Bruce Davidson's image too. I see tension in the background of the people around her kind of being nervous about what's happening in the moment and tension in the police officer's face, but I see her in complete control of that moment and knowing exactly what she's there to do. Um, so I like kind of that comparison and thinking about moments documenting protests now that we don't yet have in the collection, but you know, hopefully someday we do have documentation of what's going on right now. Um, this is another version or another moment of that same another frame of that same moment um, that is not in our collection, but this is the one that's more published. And I apologize, it's kind of a grainy file. Um, and I like this one too, but you don't feel that as much of like her controlling the moment. I do like that the marquee in the back says, damn the defiant. Um, I find that to be kind of funny, but it's not as you don't see the tension as much and you don't see that control in, uh, in her expression in this image. But this is the one that's more public, published out there of this moment. And so then that ends kind of our civil rights chapter. Um, there's a lot more in the collection and I encourage you to go to our website and search under the collection if there's any of artists that I'm showing now. We have many more and you can see all of them on our, um, our website by searching the artist's name. Um, but I wanted to transition a little bit to this great uh, collage diptych by Krista Franklin that is paying tribute to some of the people we just talked about um, and sort of the activists before her. The title is She Taught Us How to Fight, which I think tells you a lot about what she's thinking about. Um, and I, I'm curious if the people watching want to chime in and tell me who they see, if you all recognize the people in this. Um, since we can't have a real discussion, normally I would say, who's in this? And if you could tell me, but I would love to hear um, any of you Chime in. Yep, Rosa Parks is in there. Audrey Lord, absolutely. Hi, Lorenzo. Um, yeah, Audrey Lord, Rosa Parks, Angela Davis. Yep. Anybody else recognize Asada? Yep, Asada Shakur, Sajerto Truth. Yep, exactly. So you guys have found them. Um, so she's, uh, Krista Franklin is collaging and some of her heroes here over sewing paper that um, kind of references the patterns and sewing papers that her, um, the women in her uh, background and her maternal line would use to kind of create clothing um, as well as pages from Ebony and Jet magazines. So thinking about a lot of um, kind of the strength of living as a black woman in America and sort of paying tribute to people who have allowed her to have the freedoms that she does have as a black woman living in America. 
uh, fully recognizing that that is a continuous struggle. It's not something that has been like fully achieved, but we have things like the liberated look here and some of the things that she's collaging in. Um, and then of course, images of, of hair and like beauty products. So sort of establishing the like strength and beauty of, of being a black American woman. So Krista Franklin is one of my favorite Chicago artists and she will be in our next exhibition that opens in January. So please check the museum's website about that exhibition. I'm very excited about it. Um, and then I wanted to shift. So thinking about influences a little bit, um, I wanted to shift back to some more historical work. This is not in the show, but if, if I were putting together works in the exhibition about democracy, I would absolutely include this. Um, this is our only piece by Tina Madotti, and we just recently acquired it. It's called Woman with Flag from 1928. Uh, Tina Madotti, somebody should make a film about her if there's not already one. I know there was a book made recently. Um, she was kind of overshadowed by Edward Weston, who was like her lover and kind of mentor figure, um, or maybe mentor for a little while, but she makes very different work. Um, they went to Mexico City in 1925, I believe, um, and she then there joined the Communist Party and really started making work that was about revolutionary politics. Um, she, her images were all about sort of spreading political messages and, and being an activist. Um, this is the only one we have, but I find it so interesting because you don't see any information on the flag. You don't know what this moment is capturing, but sort of like the Bruce Davidson we were talking, image we were talking about and that strength of the person in the image, you feel kind of her control of that moment and you feel like her dedication to that moment in the body language and sort of just her being in the center of the frame and draping this huge flag over her body kind of devoted to whatever cause she has. So I like this image a lot. And I also brought it up because Nadati uh, was part of kind of a larger group of artists at working in Mexico City in this time period that all sort of influenced or mentored each other. And one of them is um, Manuel Alvarez Bravo. So this image is in the collection. It's in, in the, I'm sorry, they're all in the collection. This is in the exhibition. Um, this is a heavy image to look at. And I'm sorry if it's difficult for you all to look at. I just wanted to briefly talk about it. Um, because the title is A Striking Worker Killed. Um, this is in the show as part of a larger installation that I'll talk about in a minute, but Bravo was not an artist that was thinking politically so much about his work. He was more an artist that was documenting what was around him in Mexico where he lived and was raised and was working nearby on a film scene when he heard gunshots and wandered over to see what happened and saw where these sugar mill workers were striking and the police killed this, this was the leader of their movement. And he just photographed it right after it happened, um, very much in the style of the way he photographs, um, kind of in a way it's eerie to me that his work was so much about just kind of the everyday, but his work was also strangely sort of surrealist in a lot of the th imagery that he makes. It's normal everyday moments in very unbelievable kind of ways without making that like surrealism like you think of with Salvador Dali and the melting eyeballs or anything like that but just things that shouldn't happen but do happen um this is more I guess typical like I love this image it's pure poetry to me called the eclipse this is not in the show but just to give you a sense more of Bravo's style um someone hanging laundry and these white sheets and then draping this black gauze over and then calling it the eclipse and leaving sort of this little hand here in the middle like this is more typical of his style. Um, but I find it interesting that Bravo even says about his work that you shouldn't, let me find the exact quote. Um, he says, you should shoot what you see, not what you think. A photographer's philosophy should not should be not to have one. Um, very different than Tina Madotti and a lot of the artists we're talking about, but I thought that was so interesting to then photograph something so heavy as a, as a worker who was striking and then murdered by the police. Um, so this is a heavy point in the show and there are other heavy points in the show, but um, I wanted to talk a little bit more about the, the um, other artists that were kind of influencing each other and then I'll tell you a little bit more about how that piece is installed. Um, so Bravo was a teacher to Graciela Iturbide, who's also, this piece is in the show and, um, and he became sort of a mentor to her. She's one of Mexico's most famous living artists this is her most famous piece. So I love that we have it in the collection. There have been statues and murals created of this piece in Oaxaca. Um, 
so it's called Our Lady of the Iguanas, and essentially Graciela Iturbide works in a similar style to Bravo, where she's photographing um, her surroundings and things in a more kind of natural, organic, not set up way of documenting what she sees. She was working in a market and saw this woman walking in the market with the iguanas on her head, um, going to sell them at her, her vendor station and asked her to take this photograph. So she's calling it Our Lady of the Iguanas, kind of referencing Our Lady Guadalupe and that kind of um, iconic imagery we know of the Virgin Mary, um, but positioning this figure who is just kind of working in a market uh, living her daily life in this way that is very like elevated with this crown of iguanas, which again, thinking about surrealism, this is definitely surrealism to me. Um, and Iturbide is also very good at that, like Bravo. Um, but this project is so interesting to me too, the Yucatan project she did um, about this, uh, this society of women, indigenous women in this area of Mexico where uh, it's a completely matriarchal led society. So women ruling everything from like the economy all the way to religious rituals and how families are run and everything. So um, Iturbide documented that and, oops, excuse me, documented um, many different people that are living in this area of Mexico in this larger project that is very beautiful. And we only have a few in our collection, but I encourage you to look at her website because they're all posted there and they're just stunning. Um, but this one is called political rally and it's not in the show either. I don't know what the political rally is, but I felt like I had to include it in this show. I love the bizarre kind of dress going on. Um, and I don't know what what the, the rally is for again, but um, I thought it was a, a fun one to include. So we'll go back to this image and I just wanna tell you how it was installed. So in the museum, this is on one side of the wall and on the other, we have this image by Greg Steinmack of a man in Vermont mowing his lawn. Um, the curator of this portion of the exhibition installed these lawn mowing photographs on one side, and then on the other side, images of protest or conflict. Um, and in the middle, you'll see there's this iPad here. This is a um, Josh Fisher. He's a professor of interactive arts and media. <coughs> Excuse me, and he's set up this iPad in the center of the museum where you can interact and you say your thoughts on the work, on the installation. And the iPad kind of creates this bot that transforms your speech and kind of um, alters it and then creates these like virtual speaking bots that are, are switching up your language and changing it for you. So he's kind of commenting on the ways that we think about democracy and politics through the filter of the internet and these technologies we use with like social media or like automated searches and Google and things like that where you're kind of getting the news you want to get based on like previous searches and sort of this like virtual self that you have out there that has political beliefs attached to it. So he's also thinking too then about the like polarization. So on the left side you have kind of the complacency, like if you want to just ignore everything going on in the world and not know about the conflicts going on and not know about human struggle and continue to keep your lawn pristine and perfect, or if you choose to kind of get in it and, and identify with the struggle and maybe uh, be motivated to act. This is my interpretation on him selecting those, those two sides of the wall. Um, but it's a really fascinating installation and I, I love kind of the way that he's using the collection in this way to create that, that heavy contrast. And I should say that Greg Steinmeck's work, although it seems very, very banal here, he is thinking about America through a critical lens with pretty much all of his work. So this series is about people mowing their lawns and these kind of like American tropes, like he also has made work about shooting ranges and car culture and the road trip and sort of these patterns of American consumption. Um, so we'll shift to Ai Weiwei um, because you can't talk about activism and art without talking about Ai Weiwei. This is the only one by him in our current exhibition, but we did a big exhibition of him a few years ago and we have that entire show in our archive as a study collection still. So something about Ai Weiwei is that most people don't think about him as being a photographer and he doesn't necessarily think of himself as a photographer either. He's somebody who works a lot in installation and these like 
large, um, I guess, yeah, installations, film. Uh, he himself and his activism is like an art form. Um, but when he was beginning as an artist, he carried his camera everywhere. When he first moved to New York from Beijing in the 80s, he was documenting a lot of his life and also sort of um, the people he was meeting in New York and, and a lot of everyday moments. But then, of course, a lot of protests he was going to because Ai Weiwei is always probably going to dissent against like uh, big structures of power. This is who he is. So this is a protest in New York, the Tawani Brawley protest, which if you're not familiar with, um, was based around a, a rape allegation in the 80s of a young 15-year-old um, Black girl um, who alleged that four white men who were police officers and a prosecutor uh, raped her. And so this was a protest around that. Um, this is a protest around Tompkins Square Park riots, which um, is, you can look up too, it's a lot about a, a park in New York where um, the city imposed a curfew, which essentially kicked out homeless people who had been sleeping there. Um, and then there were a lot of protests and demonstrations about basically that um, public space not being gentrified and sort of closed off from uh, the less wealthy in New York. So I, I love the way that I Weiwei photographs like this to me, it looks like a Ouija photograph. Um, it's got a lot of <laughs> intensity to it, um, but just these kind of emotions he captures too, you'll see in the next one here uh, with the, the heavy flash that he uses and this gesture of the police officer, like you get the feeling of being there. Um, here's another related to that of uh, housing demonstrations. So again, about the gentrification of New York. Um, this is an AIDS protest in 1989 uh, organized by ACT UP about calling for more government resources to finding the cure and sort of the aftermath of an AIDS protest. Um, so there's many, many more IWA photographs in our collection. Again, you should look at our website if you want to see more. But I tried to pull all that I could find that were obviously protest. Um, and then if my favorite series, oh, this is one more, sorry. Uh, this is just called Communist John. So I'm not sure what is being protested here. Um, but you have the burning flags, the homemade graffiti sign, and people covering their faces that I wonder if they're covering it to obscure their identities or if it's because of toxic smoke and things in the air, we don't know. Um, but one of my favorite <laughs> series by Ai Weiwei in photography is this study of perspectives series that he did that I think is such a simple and effective way to show protest. Um, Ai Weiwei has a really good sense of humor, so I'm a big fan of his work. Um, but he did this series for, I think from the 90s until 2017, he reopened it to do one more in 2017. Um, but this is him um, at the Metropolitan Museum of Art and he calls it study of perspective, which I think is funny too, because when you're an artist and a photographer, you're working with perspective and sort of your depth of field. So he's using his own hand to kind of measure the depth of field, but then extending his middle finger at these places that represent institutions of power. So here we have the Met, the White House. This was taken in 1995. We got some pushback on social media that people thought we were commenting on presidents now. And this is just, it doesn't, it's timeless. <laughs> um, Tiananmen Square, which I talked about in another photos and Zoom session. But um, as we're talking about protests, it's important to talk about Tiananmen Square, the site where students um, were demonstrating and uh, were killed by, by the government for demonstrating. Um, so this is him there in his home country, um, but he does these study of perspective um, actions all over the world. Here's another at the Eiffel Tower. So we have quite a few of these at the museum as well. And they're actually all sitting behind uh, my colleague Karen Irvine's desk. So if you ever visiting her in her office, you'll see these all installed in her office right now. And this one I wanted to show as well because it's him um, doing the study of perspective in front of the surveillance camera that was monitoring him. So if you read up on Ai Weiwei, you'll learn that he was detained by the Chinese government in um, 2011 and had been closely, always closely monitored by them because of his um, views against uh, kind of the government and many, many human rights violations. Um, and there's, this, <laughs> I found this today, this mask that he's selling right now to fundraise for Human Rights Watch and Doctors Without Borders, um, where he's printed uh, the middle finger on a mask that you can purchase right now if you're interested. This is not in our collection. 
Um, so I have just one more artist to talk about and then we have time for questions, but um, whenever, so thinking about too, again, the kind of uh, good and bad when you're thinking about protest, I wanted to end with this um, batch of images that um, Melanie Chambliss has in her installation by Suzette Bross, who is a Chicago-based photographer um, of the election night from Obama's election night in 2008. So Suzette Bross does a lot of these kind of um, thinking about photography almost as performance, like carrying the camera with her, documenting walks she's taking or um, road trips she's taking. Like she's using a camera more as like, I think an interpretation of like her movements of her body. Um, but she did these sort of like point and shoot photos of the election night. I think trying to just capture that energy of everyone gathering um, in Chicago, in Grant Park, again, across from the museum um, on the night that he was elected. So, and of course, Chicago, that was a really big deal because he is from Chicago, but also he led this sort of grass, more grassroots um, campaign than we had ever had in history. So Suzette's capturing a lot of the homemade t-shirts that people made or people were selling like stickers and buttons and all, there was just so much um, celebration happening, but also kind of like this market of people who had created things to commemorate the moment. So um, these two are in the show. I think it was these two. No, sorry, there's another one. Anyway, there's several in the collection. There's 44 in the collection, um, but there's two in the exhibition and this is one. And just thinking about, again, we talked about earlier with that Danny Lyon image, celebrating the efforts of your actions. Like it's kind of sweet to me that this isn't, it's just change happened. Like thinking about if you feel discouraged right now or you know in the past, few years with the protests or efforts you're fighting for like nothing is going to move i thought it was sort of sweet that one of the curators put this in to kind of maybe remind us that sometimes you know things are always moving in both directions um so this is another kind of uh close shot of one of the more like homemade t-shirts but what i also like about this work that it's in our collection um is whenever we worked with teju cole on his exhibition and where he was interpreting our collection, we asked him what the museum was missing in our collection. And he said, perhaps the vernacular, like thinking about this everyday photography and people who are carrying cameras around with them all the time in their pockets. And does that deserve to be archived and collected and telling our stories right now? So Suzette Bruss, when she created this series, it's more that like point and shoot. It's not like setting up a big tripod and, and composing the scene and getting the perfect picture like she's capturing like the movement of that night and I was there there was a lot of people there was a lot going on it was like impossible to know where to look because everything was so interesting and so she kind of captured that in this project and I appreciate that it was chosen for um, inclusion in this exhibition so with that I'm gonna stop and if anybody has questions I would love to hear them um, I hope you all, someone says, what was the philosophy quote? Peter, you're gonna have to tell me which philosophy quote you're referencing. I'd be happy to answer that, but I'm not sure um, which one you're talking about. Um, and as I'm asking for questions, I'm gonna tell you too that next week we are doing another print viewing, highlighting works in this exhibition um, by Erica McKeon, our curatorial assistant. And she's going to talk more about the idea of joy and community too, because that's a big part of this exhibition is not everybody is showing um, the dark moments of democracy, but also showing gatherings. And especially now as we're in like month 10 of social isolation, thinking about gathering in community is something I think we're all very thirsty for <laughs> right now. So Erica will be focusing on some of those images um, next week at the exact same time at noon. Um, Marjorie Ornston, asked if we acquired more images specifically for this show. No, um, the artists or the curators all worked with what we have in the collection. Um, we typically, when we're acquiring new work into the collection, a lot of times we do it the other way around. We'll buy work after we've exhibited it and sort of lived with it for a little while and seen how it's gone over with students and what they're interested in. Um, so the collection in some ways is almost like a backlog of past exhibitions. Um, oh, the quote from shoot what, shoot what you see, not what you think. That was by Manuel Alvarez Bravo. Um, and let me find it for you. I think that's essentially what he said. <laughs> um, I have lots of notes here. Um, it 
and of course I can't find it. Um, let me find that for you. I'm so sorry. Here it is. Yeah, he said, shoot what you see, not what you think. A photographer's philosophy should be not to have one. That's what Bravo said about um, his thoughts on photography as he taught students how to photograph. Um, let's see what else. Uh, Vishan Jordan says that he or they have recently released images of protests in a book called Chicago Protests, A Joyful Revolution. I think I saw that work. Um, if you are the student at Columbia that is photographing protest, and if you are, that's really cool and it's a great project. Yeah, that's so great. I'm glad you're here. Um, yeah, great work and please keep doing that. Your work is so interesting. Um, yeah, so Yvette Meltzer says, interesting, there are quotes about how a photographer reveals what one thinks. Yeah, there. I think there are a lot of artists that would disagree with Bravo. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm not gonna say necessarily where I think of that, but um, I would think it'd be sort of hard not to show your thoughts on things. But I also appreciate trying to just objectively see. Um, Anonymous attendee says, how has traditional political and social photographers been impacted by social media and amateur iPhone images? That is a great question. Um, I think photographers have to answer that, um, but I would say that we're seeing that um, iPhone imagery is, is just getting stronger and stronger. Like our chair of the photo department at Columbia College, Ross Sawyer says, he doesn't even call it an iPhone, he calls it an iCamera camera because the technology is so good on the camera now that um, everyone has this like amazing tool in their pocket. So we're gonna see more and more of that, I think, where um, less and less it's about what kind of camera you have and more about what you're saying. Um, Lorenzo Trebergo says, can you speak about the installation of the tree and the other graphics attached to the walls? Yes, thank you. Um, so Honor Ozturk is a professor of art and art history at Columbia College, and he's from Turkey. So when he was thinking about what democracy looks like, he was thinking about it for more from a global perspective. Um, and I should say that every professor we invited, we invited specifically for the different types of levels of experience and backgrounds they have. So we have professors teaching dance, or interactive arts and media or journalism, um, all wanting kind of like different views on that question. So he was thinking about global connectivity. So the tree as a metaphor for democracy and sort of how all of our actions are interconnected that we're all kind of the branches of this tree of democracy. He also printed the lines of a poem um, on the wall, which I printed here, let me find it. Um, that was from a Turkish, famous Turkish poet um, that says to live like a tree alone and free and in a forest like brothers and sisters. And that was written by Nazim Hikmet, a poet. Um, that's also written on the wall of the museum um, as you walk in. So Lorenzo's thinking a lot, I'm sorry, not Lorenzo, that's you. Um, Honor is thinking a lot about the ways that what we're doing in our democracy here in America is connected to everyone else in the globe and vice versa, um, that we're all sort of in this like, connected humanity. Um, so I didn't say it earlier, so no, it was great. Um, do we have any other questions? Please let me know. Um, but thank you all so much for being here. And I hope that you'll join us next week and just stay tuned on the museum's social media channels and our website as we'll be announcing more photos of Zoom events and other sessions coming up. Um, but thank you all so much and we look forward to seeing you again soon.